I've been instructed to really make two points. The first is that in light of recent elections, both on the state level and on the national level, in light of what we've seen on the national level, it is incumbent on all of us to be able to reach common ground and to work together for the benefit of the people who are our bosses. And I hope on the national level that a message has been sent, notwithstanding the fact that it, they appear to be continuing the same division that they had before, but I hope that the message has been sent that they expect those folks to work together. I know that message exists in Arkansas because Arkansas has consistently and continuously been able to work together, and I always see that glass half full, and I have no doubt that we'll be able to do that uh, in Arkansas because I have no doubt that Republicans and Democrats alike uh, want to ensure that the people of Arkansas are properly represented and, and that whatever uh, gridlock may exist elsewhere in the country, that that will not exist with our own people. To that end, it is incumbent, I think, on the people in this room to educate yourselves on the various possible scenarios on any given issue that will confront us as a people. Satisfy yourself about all sides and all arguments, pro and con, for any given issue. And then utilize, as you should, your leadership and your leadership positions to ensure that people in Arkansas actually work together in a way that benefits all of the people of our state in a fashion that allows us to continue what has to be the extraordinary progress under anybody's scenario that all our Kansans should be proud of and that all our Kansans should take credit for. You must, it seems to me, going forward, exert your leadership capacity because it is vital and important to our people. I'm not trying to tell you to exert it on this issue or that issue. Uh, as I indicated, uh, I want you to inform yourself on the various issues and make up your own mind. But once you do, please try to utilize what you can to ensure progress as opposed to gridlock. The other thing that I've been tasked, I think, to mention uh, is way more substantive than anything I normally get up here and talk about with regard to uh, my brief remarks in front of this uh, annual meeting, and that's specifically Medicaid. And, and without trying to influence you one way or the other, merely being informative, let me just take a very brief moment uh, to, I, I guess, highlight what the issues are. And then again, you make up your own mind and decide what you think is important and if you think it's important. There are three distinct, however, somewhat interrelated issues as it comes to, as it uh, deals with Medicaid. Now, you don't want to hear all this deep stuff about Medicaid when we're usually talking about grander ideas of education, economic development, and how we improve the quality of life of our people. But I think it's such a confusing issue that I need to just briefly mention all three. First, you've got payment reform. Payment reform has nothing to do with Obamacare, has nothing to do with Medicaid expansion, but it does have some degree of an effect on both. Payment reform was really our approach in Arkansas long before they started doing anything in Washington. We started talking about this a couple years ago before they passed anything. And frankly, uh, I suggested to people in Washington they ought to be tackling this problem first. And that's costs, health care costs. If anybody understands that, it's the employers and the businesses that are represented in this room. And we came to the conclusion, I was convinced by some of the people that work for me, primarily our Surgeon General, fee for service is unsustainable. The good news is doctors, hospitals, health care providers, insurance companies, patients, all sorts of folks that interact in this network have really worked for a couple of years hard together to try to stop this spiraling cost curve in healthcare costs. And that's being done through payment reform. And it's gradually, but with some degree of sensitivity and input from the people that are actually having to do the work on the front line changing away from fee-for-service, which pays for every time somebody writes a, 
uh, something on a chart or every time somebody does another test. And you got to be careful because you got to do that in a way that doesn't adversely impact quality or else you're really going in the wrong direction. It is extremely complex, but the extraordinary cooperation we've seen in the business community and healthcare community across the board, and I got to tell you, your state chamber's done a wonderful job in helping educate everybody about this and having input into all of it. Uh, it is one issue. Set it over here. Second issue is Medicaid shortfall. We have a shortfall in Medicaid. That means that we are going to either have to cut services or come up with some more money or more probably a combination of both in order to keep our budget balanced. There are a number of ways potentially we could do that. But let me explain the major reason why we got a Medicaid shortfall. There's another reason. There's a couple of reasons. But the biggest reason we got a Medicaid shortfall is your fault. We are the victim of our own success. Arkansas has passed more states, I think, than anybody in the country, certainly climbed four higher than we have ever been in per capita income. Now, we're still way down. I think we're 44th according to the last numbers, and I don't like being 44th in anything, but we were 48th four years ago, ladies and gentlemen, and when you're now 44th in the statistic that's the hardest to change, it's great news. And you all in this room, together with so many others, are largely responsible for the fact that our people are, are climbing the ladder vis-a-vis -vis their sister states, or in some cases, not going backwards as fast as the sister states. And consequently, we have our formula changed. Because you see, in the past, the feds paid 75% of the Medicaid budget, the existing Medicaid budget, and we paid 25%. Because we have climbed these per capita income rankings and because of what we've done as a state, the formula has changed. We now have to pay roughly 30% instead of 25%. So it's going to be a 70-30 match. And every percent is about a $40 million hit on the existing program. So the major reason, there's another couple of reasons, but the major reason for the Medicaid shortfall is because we have gone up in our income, and the federal match changes accordingly. Set that aside. The third issue is Medicaid expansion. Medicaid expansion is the one part of what they called Obamacare that the state has some discretion over. You don't have any more discretion over whether you got it or not. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled. They didn't throw it out. The people acted, and they kept a Democratic Senate, a Republican House, and a Democratic President. It's not likely to change on the federal level. And I don't have any control over what happens on the federal level, and if you want any control, then you're going to have to do something about it on the federal level, not with me. So the one area that the Supreme Court said you still got some degree of discretion over is whether you accept Medicaid expansion or not. Very briefly, Medicaid, as opposed to Medicare, Medicaid is that 70-30 program now I'm talking about, and it primarily, there's some exceptions, primarily covers kids right now and nursing homes. Folks in nursing homes, that's, that's it. Now, there's some other examples, but I'm oversimplifying this to get the heck out of here and let your keynote speaker come talk about whatever he's going to talk about. This Medicaid expansion covers working people, working people with $30,000 a year income and below that are between 18 and 64. Now, here's the kicker on this. It takes 75% of the House and 75% of the Senate to accept Medicaid expansion. And you've seen some states say they're not going to accept it. I was worried about it at the outset because I wanted to know if we couldn't afford in whatever match we had to pay, could we get out of it? They told me we could. I said, I don't believe you. I want it in writing. So we got it in writing. That solved my initial problem. So while I'm not trying to tell you which way to go on this, I think you're intelligent enough to make up your own minds. I'm going to tell you it's convinced me it's the right thing for the people of Arkansas. But if three-fourths of the House and Senate don't want to do it, it's not going to happen anyway. Here is what happens. Medicaid expansion can have a peripheral effect by several million dollars on the Medicaid shortfall. Additionally, 
we're going to be paying these taxes federally that covers this or this deficit federally that our children are going to be paying, whether we accept it or whether we don't accept it. And if there's six, eight, or ten states that don't accept it, that's fine. They're still going to be paying too. I don't want to leave our Kansans out. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to save some hospitals. It's going to save some rural hospitals. It's $23 million, isn't it, Dr. Ron, to you? Annually. $23 million to UAMS alone. If we don't get it, there will be services cut. If we don't get it, there are some rural hospitals that will be significantly hurt. Most importantly, if we don't get it, there are a lot of people that are going to be uncovered, and they are what's causing all of our insurance premiums to go up if they're showing up in the emergency rooms for more expensive care, and hospitals have to treat them for nothing. And they do, because under the law they have to, and that's called uncompensated care. And that means you and I that carry insurance get our insurance premiums jacked up, and I'm not picking on hospitals. I chaired a hospital board for 10 years. That jacks up our hospital premiums because they can't run at a loss, or our insurance premiums, because they can't run at a loss. So they have to make up the losses on all the uncompensated care by those of us that are carrying it. It will have a positive effect on the rest of us that aren't covered by Medicaid in helping to work together with payment reform to keep those costs from going up. Now, it may sound like I am trying to influence you. I'm telling you the truth as I see it. Other people can tell you the truth as they see it, and you're smart enough to figure it out, or you wouldn't be running the companies you're running and making the jobs that you're making. You can make up your own mind as to what's true and what's not true. But I'll use an analogy that I've been using. It's like federal highway money. Maybe we can't afford it. Maybe there's... Uh, hey, I've been talking about deficits on the federal level before those people started talking about it, okay? And we actually had a governor from Arkansas that had that figured out and had it fixed for a while in Washington, D.C., before they messed it up up there. So I'm a proponent of balancing a budget. We do it here. And I, I'm a proponent of getting rid of this deficit. But to use the analogy, if you're going to be spending highway dollars and we're going to be paying that in the way of our federal, our, our taxes to Washington or in terms of our children paying for that deficit going forward, I don't want to leave Arkansas out. Don't send my highway money to California. Don't send my highway money to New York. And don't send my Medicaid money to Illinois and leave my people and my hospitals and my doctors and my employers and my folks in Arkansas out. That's where I am. Those are three distinct different Medicaid issues. As you go forward and watch all three, understand they are three distinct different problems and different issues, but to some extent they have some interrelation and they affect one another. I normally don't come make a speech as though I'm teaching a college class. I've been asked to do it today because it's an important issue you all are important people that influence important decisions, and you need to know what I know as I see it. And as I say, there are folks on the other side that will give you a different picture. I, I trust your judgment to listen to what everybody's got to say and figure it out for yourself. I've oversimplified it. I've gone in a hurry, but I think it's important. And, you know, y'all quit eating and started listening. It's the dangest bunch I ever saw. Thank you very, very much.